Well, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. You recall we mentioned that the book of Hebrews deals with the fact that Jesus is better. He's better than everything and better than everyone. So far, we've seen that Jesus is better than the prophets, He's better than the angels, and He's better than Moses. And last time we were together, we began a section dealing with the fact that He is a better rest. It began in chapter 3, verse 7, and will continue through chapter 4, verse 13, our study today. And last time we were together, we saw the example of the children of Israel, how God had called the children of Israel out of 430 years of Egyptian captivity, out of slavery, took them out of Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, which is only about a mile or so from the Israeli border in ancient times. And he said, go into the promised land and, you know, take it. But they did not. They were disobedient to God because of their lack of faith in God. And because of that, they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. And they were never able to enter into the promised land or God's rest, as the author made that parallel. Well, as we come to chapter 4, we, of course, continue to deal with the fact that Jesus is a better rest. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1, reading down through verse 13 in our study today. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. And as he has said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, clearly, the author is continuing with this theme that Jesus is a better rest. In fact, 11 times. In these last 26 verses, all the way back to chapter 3, verse 7, the word rest or rested is used. Now, in our previous study, we saw it was very informational. However, in this study, we'll see it is very applicational. There's a lot of application as it pertains to Jesus being a better rest. Now, for you note takers, you outliners, there are seven things we want to look at as it pertains to Jesus being a better rest. Seven things. Number one, the first thing involves the promise of His rest. The promise of His rest. That's in verses 1 and 2. Take a look. Back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest. Now stop right there. So God's promise of of rest remains for everyone. We all have an opportunity, we all have a chance to receive God's promise of rest. However, in verses 1 and 2, we do see it involves two things. First of all, it involves fear. It involves fear. Look at the middle of verse 1. It said, let us 
fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, when it talks about fearing God, it doesn't mean we're afraid of God. It means that we have a reverential awe toward God. And the context is dealing with standing in awe of the fact that God's promise of rest is still available to all. It remains, as the author puts it. So the first thing about the promise of His rest involves fear. But the second thing involves faith. It involves faith. Look at verse 2. It says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, those who didn't believe, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Well, because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. So yeah, the promise of God's rest remains, it's available to all of us, but it involves fear, having that reverential awe of God, and it involves faith, having faith in God. In other words, we can hear the gospel message all day. You know, the gospel simply means good news. It's God loving us so much, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on Calvary's cross. Through His shed blood and through His resurrection, we can have all of our sins forgiven and forgotten, and we can have gained entrance into the kingdom of heaven, and we can enter His rest, speaking of heaven. That's the good news. But it's fallen on deaf ears. Why? Because they didn't receive it with faith. It wasn't mixed with faith. But once we put our faith in the gospel message, we now can receive the promise of His rest rest. So getting into heaven or entering God's rest involves faith, obviously. In fact, when we get to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12, the author is going to tell us through faith and patience we receive the promises. Now God has promised rest to those who put their faith in Him. That's the point. It's simple. But a, a further application for us is very powerful. Because it points to and speaks of the fact if God promised it, you can believe it. Look, if God said it, it's going to happen. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, the Bible says that all of God's promises in Him are yes and amen. In 2 Peter 1, 4, it says God's given us exceedingly great and precious promises. The question is, do we believe it? Oh, that was a question? Okay, four of you do, fine, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the question is, do we, do we really have our faith in the finished work of Christ so that we receive the promise of His rest, pointing to and speaking of eternal life? Which brings us to a second thing we want to look at. We said there were seven. The first involved the promise of His faith, but the second thing involves entrance or uh, promise of His rest, excuse me. The second thing involves entrance to His rest. Entrance to His rest. Check a look at verse 3. In verse 3 of Hebrews 4, it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. As He has said in Psalm 95, 11, here's the contrast, So I swore in my wrath they those who did not believe, shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Boy, what a contrast. A contrast between those who do believe and enter God's rest that, of course, was finished from the foundation of the world to those who don't, to those who don't believe and don't enter into His rest. So again, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we gain entrance to His rest. Now, presumably, the context is dealing with getting into heaven, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, because certainly when we go to heaven, we enter God's rest eternally, we might say. But I think there's a broader application for us, because entering into God's rest, the entrance to God's rest is not just for eternal life, it's for temporal life. It's for every moment of every day in this life. Because the truth of the matter is we all go through a lot of different things in life, do we not? We all experience a lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot of ins, a lot of outs. Hey, we, and the older you are, the, the, the more you experience it. Amen, Bob? Okay, fine. <laughs> but we have His rest. 
Therefore, we don't have to worry about tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. I don't have to be concerned about what's coming down the pike in my life because I have entrance into God's rest by faith because He has given us that glorious promise. And so no matter what's happening into or around us, there's rest, there's peace, there's tranquility, and God's given us that entrance to it. Number three, let's come to the third thing we want to look at, and that involves the illustrations of His rest. Number three, the illustrations of His rest. There are two of them. In verses 4 and 5, it says, For he, God, has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. In this way, as he quotes from Genesis 2, 2, And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now here's the second illustration in verse 5 from uh, Psalm 95, 11. It says, And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Now the first illustration is very simple. Uh, We all remember Genesis 2, 2, the creation account. Uh, It points to the seventh day. You remember God created everything in six days, and on the seventh day, He rested from His works. And please, please do not picture God sweating and tired on the seventh day. Say, man, i got to take a break. Uh, No, that's not the case. You say, well, then why does it specifically talk about the seventh day? The fact that God rested from his works? Well, that's a great question. I think it can imply at least two things. Number one, it can be pointing to the Jews because, of course, the seventh day in Judaism is the Shabbat, a day of rest. And God's intended purpose for God's chosen people, the Jews, is that for six days they would work, but on the seventh day they would do no regular work. That day would be set apart as a day to worship God. It's called the Shabbat or the Sabbath or the day of rest. So I think that that's one reason we see that seventh day of rest. It was for the people of Israel. However, I think the second reason is, be, is for us. Well, what do you mean? Well, when it says God rested on the seventh day, that was a type, a picture, a shadow of things to come pointing to and speaking of Jesus Christ himself. You say, Clark, are you sure? Oh, yes. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, Paul said, Therefore let no one judge you in light of food or drink or new moons, feast days, festivals, or Sabbaths, for these are all a shadow of things to come. The substance is of Christ. So I believe when it, back in Genesis 2, 2, when it said God rested on the seventh day, it points to and speaks of Jesus Christ. Because for you and I, the Sabbath isn't about a day. It's about a person. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul said, speaking of Jesus Christ, that he himself is our rest. He is our Shabbat. So for you and I, it's not about coming and worshiping God on a Saturday, so to speak, because for us, every day is a Shabbat. Every day is a day of rest. Why? Because our rest is in Christ. Now, our rest is not only from Christ, John chapter 14, verse 27, but according to Ephesians 2, 14, Christ is our rest. And if you have Christ, listen, precious family, if you have Christ, you have rest. That's what the Bible says. You have peace. And I think sometimes we pray for the wrong things in our lives. You know when things go upside down? When everything in our life goes south? We think, oh God, give me peace. And God looks down from heaven, you already have it. Why do we pray for things we already have? If you've got Christ, you've got our peace, precious, our peace is not based on our circumstances. Our peace is found in the person of Christ. Now, I also find it very interesting in verse 5, in this second illustration from uh, Psalm 95, 11, and we'll talk more on that this Wednesday, Lord willing. 
It says they, those who did not believe and enter the promised land coming out of Egyptian captivity, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter the promised land. Now, note carefully, class, God talks about His rest. They shall not enter my rest. God's rest. Question. Does God worry about things? Does God freak out about things? Does God fret about things? No, of course not. He's God. And we have His rest. Everyone okay? So why do we get so worried, so freaked out about circumstances and situations in our lives? Boy, you guys are full of questions today, by the way. I think sometimes the problem is we begin to look at our situation with our physical eyes. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul said, Do not look at the things that are seen, for the things that are seen are temporary. But rather, look at the things that are not seen, for the things that are not seen are eternal. I think sometimes we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto our circumstances, and we begin to freak out a little bit. We begin to come unglued. We get a little anxious and rolls into anxiety, and pretty soon we feel like curling up in a ball and just pulling the covers over our head. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? Yeah, okay, a few of us. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, we've got rest. We've got peace because we have Christ. Well, number four. Let's come to the fourth thing. We have to hurry. The fourth thing involves the reason for not entering His rest. Number four, the reason for not entering His rest. It's found in verse 6. Take a look. Hebrews 4, 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter His rest, those who believe, and those to whom it was first preached there in the wilderness did not enter because of disobedience. So the reason for not entering His rest is disobedience. When God took the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity, out of 430 years of slavery, He said, go into the promised land. Go! But the Israelites didn't think that was such a good idea. So they sent in some spies, 12. Remember the story? Only two came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb. All the rest came back and said, no way, Mo, we, we're not going in that land. There's giants there, man. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to crush us like bugs. Now, they were disobedient in not going into the promised land. However, their disobedience, according to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, came about as a result of a lack of faith. They didn't believe God's promise of entering His rest or His promised land. They thought they were going to be squished like bugs. So they were disobedient to God. And you know, as I thought about that for a moment, <laughs> I couldn't help but think about the correlation between a lack of faith and disobedience to God. Because one reason we're disobedient to God is because, well, we don't believe God. If we truly believed, if we truly had faith in God's Word, we would do what it said. But sometimes it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. It seems illogical, unrational. It, it doesn't seem right. I mean, you follow me? I mean, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that we should love our enemies. Well, I think we should nuke them. <laughs> now, I know uh, you can pray for me, all of you no, would never think things like that. You're much too holy and spiritual, and I, I'd like to touch you after service. Maybe it'll rub off. But hey, the rest of us, we need prayer. Because even though we know what God's Word says to do, our natural tendency is not to do it. Why? Well, I think ultimately because we don't believe. We don't have faith. But when we truly believe that God's Word is God's Word, we're going to do what God said. And it always boils down to faith. Faith. 
In fact, when we get to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, the writer's going to tell us that the just will live by faith. Yeah. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said we're to walk by Yeah, it all, it's all about faith. When we get to Hebrews chapter 11, that's the faith hall of fame. Verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. Look, it's all about faith. So the question is, who are we going to believe? God or us? And when we believe God, when we put our faith in God and His Word, the byproduct of that, the result of that is typically we'll do what He says. Well, back to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's come to a fifth thing we want to look at. We said there were seven. The fifth section deals with the urgency regarding His rest. Number five, the urgency regarding His rest. That's in verses 7 and 8. In Hebrews 4, 7, it says again, He designates a certain day, singular, saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, quoting from Psalm 95, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now this, of course, points to and speaks of the urgency regarding his rest. We saw this back in chapter 3, verse 7. In chapter 3, verse 15, in chapter 3, verse 18, and again here in chapter 4, verse 7. In fact, in this section dealing with Jesus being a better rest, the word today is used five times. Today, today, today. That speaks of the urgency regarding His rest. You say, well, Clark, why is today so important? <laughs> well, because tomorrow may never come. No matter how you slice it, life is short. In fact, James 4.14 says, our life's a vapor. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. Now, I'm not here to burst anybody's bubble, but, you know, for those of you who are young and think you've got a long life ahead of you, hey, you, you better think again. Because I'm not sure what tomorrow holds. But I do know who holds tomorrow. And the urgency really is something. You, you know, it's interesting. Every year during the Christmas week, it seems like as we're celebrating Christmas, the joy of the birth of Jesus, man, the trees, the presents, the food, the family, the fellowship. I mean, it's just a, we're way up here, right? Inevitably, here at the church, we'll have two or three people go home to be with the Lord that week. And it just really, I mean, it just crushes your heart. It breaks your heart. In fact, one year, I remember Sally and I were talking about this, we had five people within a one week go home to be with Jesus. Five people during the Christmas week. Put a little damper on your holidays, you know what I'm saying? The point is, life is short. And so there is an urgency about receiving His rest. And maybe you're here today and Maybe you've just been putting this decision off regarding Jesus. and you, You've just been kind of neutral as it pertains to Christ. Well, I'm here to tell you, there is no neutrality in Christianity. Jesus said, you are for me or against me. There's no sitting on the fence. There's no straddle in the line. Either we're in or we're out. Either we're going to heaven or we're going to hell. That's what the Bible says. And if this is a decision you think you can put off until you graduate from school or get a better job or get married or buy a house or whatever you think a goal might be before you come to faith in Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that might not happen. You say, wow, Clark, this is a great way to start out the new year. <laughs> hey, the truth is the truth. And when we come across it in Scripture, we need to preach it. Today, in fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he said, today is the acceptable day. Today is the day of salvation. Because tomorrow is promised to no man. In fact, note carefully, class, at the end of verse 7, he's talking about hardening your hearts. Talk about the urgency. Do not harden your hearts. I think this is important because it would seem that we could come to a place in our life where we harden our heart against God for so long, God finally says, okay, fine. 
In fact, in Genesis 6-3, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. In Romans 1-28, the Bible says that because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, in their mind, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So it would seem that there could come a point in time where God says, okay, fine, if that's how you want it, that's how you get it. Number six, let's come to the sixth thing. We said there were seven, and that involves a lack of work for his rest. I like this one, a lack of work for his rest. That's in verses 9 and 10. In Hebrews 4, 9, it says, There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, you and I, we've entered God's rest, has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from him when God finished his work. You see, just as, um, God, just as we enter God's rest, we cease from our works. That's the point of verses 9 and 10. When we enter God's rest, we cease from our works. Now, that can be looked at in two ways. The first way deals with eternal life, eternal life. I think we all understand that there's no way we can work our way to heaven. There's no amount of good deed or good effort we can do to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. We understand Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We understand Romans 3, 24, that we're justified freely by grace. There's no amount of good effort or good deed we can accomplish to gain entrance into the kingdom of God. So one aspect involves this idea of uh, eternal life, specifically, specifically pointing to the Jews. What do you mean? Well, he was dealing with the seventh day, the Shabbat, and the rest that was uh, coming about at that day. And I think the point of verses 8 and 9 in dealing with the Jews and eternal life become pretty significant because presumably the Jews who came to faith in Jesus Christ were falling back into works of the law, specifically keeping the Sabbath. You say, well, Clark, what makes you so sure of that? Well, there in verse 9, the word rest, it's the only time that particular Greek word is used in the entire New Testament. It is the word sabbatismo. It means to keep the Sabbath. So clearly, it's a reference to the Jews going back to legalism. Now, that is one way we can apply it to eternal life. But I think there's a second way we can apply it, and that's to temporal life temporal life. Because by faith, you and I enter into God's rest every single moment of every single day. And when we enter into His rest, we enter into a victorious Christian life, we might say. You know, I think sometimes we put the cart before the horse. We think, well, you know, I, I want to live a victorious Christian life. I want to grow and mature in my walk with the Lord. I want to become a better Christian this year than I was last year. And these are good things to, to have in our heart. Don't get me wrong. But we have a tendency to apply works to that idea. Well, how can I be more victorious? How can I grow and mature as a believer? Well, I go to church twice a week. I pray every day. I am involved in, in helping with the children's ministry. Well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Hey, don't get me wrong. These are all good things. <laughs> but these are not things we necessarily do to live a victorious life. This is the byproduct or the result of having a victorious life. We've got to be careful not to put the cart before the horse. So how can we live victoriously? Oh, it's in, through, and because of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Paul said, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Paul said, we are more than conquerors through Him who saves us. So it's a work of Christ from start to finish. And I say, praise God for that. Well, let's come to the seventh and final thing. We have to hurry. We only have 45 minutes left. Num <laughs> Number seven and finally... The seventh and final section involves the exhortation about his rest. Number seven, the exhortations about his rest in verses 11 through 13. There are three of them. Exhortation number one involves the diligence that's needed. The diligence that's needed. Take a look at verse 11. 
Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall like the children of Israel in the wilderness after the same example of disobedience, we might say. So here we find a balance, practically speaking. From an applicational standpoint, how do we enter God's rest? Oh, we are diligent. We're to make haste. We're to hurry up. Now, this doesn't mean we work at it. Don't misunderstand. It just means we need to be diligent or to make haste or to hurry up and not waste any time in coming to faith in Jesus Christ because tomorrow may never come. Don't put it off another. You know, I, I, I'm amazed that people would put off God's rest and continue to live without God in a life of trial and tumult rather than coming to faith in Jesus Christ and receiving His rest. I don't know how the world does it. In fact, a lot of them don't. They go off the deep end. They get hooked on drugs and you name it or go crazy. I mean, whew, without Jesus. Now, when we come to faith in Christ, it doesn't mean it's all going to be peaches and cream. It doesn't mean we won't have any problems. Don't misunderstand. In fact, the moment we come to Christ, the enemy is going to really uh, ramp up his game, so to speak. But praise be to God. <laughs> We've got the Spirit of God living in us, dwelling in us. Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Timothy, while well, you get the picture, it's replete. We've got God's Spirit dwelling in us. Therefore, we have the victory over the enemy, 1 John 4, 4, and now all of a sudden we've been diligent, in other words, we've done our part to enter into His rest. What a great exhortation. Let's come to a second thing that's involved in this exhortation. Number one, it involved the diligence that's needed, but number two, it involves the word that's used. The word that's used. Look at verse 12, a very familiar verse, you all know it. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, the exhortation here is pretty simple. It doesn't matter what we think or what we feel or what we believe. You and I can have absolute rest in the trials and tribulations we go through in life because God's Word said so. Look, if God said it, as we've already mentioned, you can believe it. And in dealing with God's Word in verse 12, the author mentions four very important aspects of God's Word. Note them carefully. Number one, it's living. God's Word is alive. It's not just ink on paper. These are God's words, literally. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3.16, we're told it's God-breathed. So number one, it's living. Number two, it's powerful powerful. You know this word powerful only used three times in the entire New Testament. We can almost say it, speak it into English. It's the word Greek word energies. Energies. Yeah, energy. It speaks of that which is capable or able, that which is powerful to do something. What is God's word powerful to do? Well, it's powerful to do a lot of things, Clark. That's true. It is. But one thing it has the power to do is to save us. And once we come to faith in Christ, once we receive salvation, we receive His rest. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says that you and I are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the Word of God. Notice a third thing about the Word of God. It's sharp. <laughs> it's sharp. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Interesting, the word sharp is only used here, nowhere else in the entire New Testament. It carries the idea of cutting something with one stroke, one slice, not many slices to finally get through. You follow me? And it points to and speaks of how sharp God's Word is because it can divide soul and spirit, bone and marrow. You say, wait a minute, Clark. Isn't the soul and the spirit virtually the same thing? Uh-huh. Isn't bone marrow and isn't marrow bone? Uh-huh. So how can you divide something that's virtually the same thing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Through God's Word, that's how. That's how powerful God's Word is. And number four, it's a discerner. It's the only time this word is used here, by the way, too. 
It speaks of being skilled or fit to judge. So God's Word is the discerner or the judge of the thoughts and intent of our heart. Now, you and I can judge people. We judge others. We should. We judge other people based on what the Bible says. What you're doing is wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. I can make that judgment. Follow me? But I cannot judge the motive behind the action. I can't judge the heart. Only God can do that. So you and I, we should judge actions based on what the Bible says. But we need to be very careful not to judge the motive. That's up to God through His Word. Well, number three and finally, real quickly. The third and final exhortation involves the accounting that's required. The accounting that's required. Take a look at verse 13. It says, And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Now the point here is pretty simple. <laughs> We're not hiding anything from God. <laughs> We're not fooling God. We're not pulling the wool over God's eyes. God knows all and He sees all. In fact, in Proverbs 15, 3, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro. He sees the good and the evil. Now we can pull the wool over our friend's eyes. We can pull the wool over our family's eyes, our co-workers. I mean, none of them are very smart. Uh, but, but we're not fooling God. And we're going to give an account to God one day. Everybody, listen gang, everybody's going to stand before God, saint and sinner alike. Sinners will stand before the great white throne of judgment mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 verse 11, subsequently cast into the lake of fire verses 14 and 15 in Revelation chapter 20, which is the second and final death. And for you and I as believers, we too will stand before God. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10, the Bible says that we will stand before the bema seat or the judgment seat of God. Christ. So even as believers, we're going to stand before God and be judged. You say, well, clearly, Clark, we're not going to be judged on our eternal life. That's true. So my question is, what are we going to be judged on? Well, it would seem that God is going to judge the motive of our hearts. Are you sure? I think so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says that all of our works will be tried as by fire to see what sort or manner they are of. So while it's important to do the right thing, we need to make sure we do it for the right reason. Because we're going to stand before God. And He's going to look at all of our works. Well, I taught Sunday school, God. I emptied the trash at church. I, I even mowed the yard once. And, and I did this and I did that. And God's going to go, okay, but why did you do it? He's going to judge the motive of the heart. So whatever we do, we need to make sure we do it with the right heart, the right motive, because all of us are going to give an account to God. The point's pretty simple. And I guess as we take a step back and just finish out this section dealing with the fact that Jesus is a better rest, it not only involves that first section, the, the warning about not believing Jesus is a better rest, but this section in walking in light of the fact that Jesus is a better rest living a life that is victorious and as a conqueror because we've entered into the rest of God, not just for eternity, but for every moment of every day of our lives. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for these few short minutes that you've given us to come and gather together to lift up our hearts, our hands to you and praise and worship through the songs we sing, the service we offer and through the study of your word. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, as we begin this new year, truly, Lord, it would be a year that, uh, well, it would bring glory to you. As we just rest in you, come what may in our lives. Lord, we understand Ephesians 1.11, that you're working all things according to the counsel of your will. So Lord, I pray that you would accomplish your plan, your purpose, your perfect will in each and every one of our lives. That we would simply rest in the fact that, well, Lord, you're in control. And we thank you for that glorious truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? 
If you need prayer today for anything at all, after service, be sure to come on up to the front. The pastors and the brothers and the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you, and just to, well, minister to any and every need you might have in your hearts and lives today. And I pray as you go forth from here, man, you go forth in the power and might of God's Spirit, that He'd fill you with His love, His grace, His mercy, that you would be that light, that beacon of hope to each and every person you come across in this new week. So may God bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you. God bless you guys. I love you so much. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.